against the machines. This is a race with the machines. Okay, so uh, I, I did, a, I did uh, ask uh, Leah to uh, join us because uh, one of her books, the one that I read, uh, when we talk about when we talk about books, uh, which is actually a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a clin d'oeil on uh, Raymond, Raymond Carver's uh, original, uh, what we talk about when we talk about love, uh, which was written, I think, sometimes in the early mid mid eighties, mid nineties. Uh, I thought it was uh, Leah's book was absolutely fantastic. It's uh, the writing is superb. It's funny. It's interesting. It's it's just a beautiful. Uh, journey into the history of the book and also into uh, what the book is will look like and sort of the transformation, connected transformation. Book. So uh, I'll start with the first easy question for you, Leah. Um, maybe tell us a bit about why you wrote the book. Um, that is actually, that's one of those questions that is easy to answer with a lie and hard to answer truly because once you look into your motives, uh, I mean, basically, I wanted there to be a book for people who are not part of the academic discipline of book history, but who are trying to figure out more about what goes on when they read a book, since there's a huge population of people who are deeply engaged with the medium of the book but tend to think about the content of books rather than about the delivery device. So I think the honest answer would be that I thought of, the, the honest answer would probably be that as a literary critic who was trained ages ago in a certain version of close reading and explication de texte that has a kind of unspoken ethical investment in the reader's self-examination. So when I have this effective response to the text, what technical details produce that effective response? I think that at some level I wanted to translate that imperative from the linguistic domain to the material and commercial and social domain so that instead of encouraging readers to think about what formal and linguistics as aspect what formal or linguistic aspects of a text were behind their own reactions to ask readers to reflect instead on what kinds of infrastructures and material objects and social conventions were behind their reactions to a text. So, I mean, she, I, I think the honest, cheesy answer would be that I wanted this book to provoke a certain kind of self-reflection or self-consciousness, a kind of awareness of what goes on when we read. Well, could you give an example of a book that you read and what your reaction to it was that was that way first? Um, you know, that's a good question, but I think I could give you, you know, I could walk to this bookshelf and pull down, oh, okay, interesting. Um, I wish I hadn't pulled down this book, but I could pull down any book at random because the aspect of the book that I'm talking about is relatively neutral vis-a-vis -vis the difference between the content of one book and the content of another book. And in a way, the negative aspect of what I was trying to do was to abstract out the textual content. So to think about, for example, what we can know about a book if we don't read a word of it. Um, so this is, you probably can't see on the Zoom camera the text of the book that I just pulled down from the shelf, but you can probably see, oh, I guess, sorry, I just gave it away. But you can see that there is one single post-it note um, 
inserted uh, into a page of the book. I mean, what what could you deduce about my relation to this book based on the placement of the post-it note? So you didn't enjoy it that much. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I mean, I highly recommend this book, The Cultivation of Hatred, Peter Gay. Um, yeah, I got, it's a big book, and I got um, kind of fed up with it, so I didn't get very far in my annotations. And, I mean, one of the, one of the things that you can learn from looking at books as material objects that are hard to learn by looking at the text of books is the kind of heat map of where most readers' attentions have concentrated historically. Um, and that tends to be at the beginning of the book and then at the end of the book for books that have an index. So that if you look, if you do a kind of uh, speed survey of books in any older library, you'll find that the pages tend to be limpest. If you just riffle through the pages, they're limpest towards the beginning and for certain kinds of books towards the end. And so one of the exercises that I sometimes ask the students in my book history course to do, and I'd love to hear later on what you guys are doing in your book history course, one of the exercises that we do is to close our eyes or put on a blindfold and then um, do what I just did, but um, say, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and pull down a book at random. If I take off my glasses, it will be just as good as closing my eyes um, because I can't really see. And then um, feel the book and see what you can tell about the genre of the book without reading it, what you can tell from the weight of the book, the texture of the pages, where the spine feels loosest, what kinds of patterns or rhythms of reading the book seems to have been subject to. And the first, the first uh, axis that students usually find themselves constructing through this um, through this exercise is that, especially if you ask them to take two books down from the shelf, they usually find a difference between books that feel as if they have been touched more, handled more at the beginning. As, and so there's a kind of steady decrease in the um, warningness of the pages as they go through, or books that have a kind of wave pattern of limp pages alternating with crisp pages. And even students who theoretically have grown up with ebooks can usually figure out from that wave pattern, that basically they uh, recreate the, dis the uh, distinction so dear to book historians between kinds of genre that are read linearly and kinds of genre that are browsed or searched. And so I think it's it's a useful way to denaturalize uh, the prescriptive message that so many of us get in school that there is a good way to read a book and that consists of reading it from start to finish in the right order. And I find this especially useful to do in, um, I mean, it's, it sounds as if many of the people in the book history class here are coming from the literature side. I will say that I find it especially useful to do in book history classes that bring together undergraduates from a variety of disciplines because it gets us into a conversation about discipline specific rhythms of reading and also task specific rhythms of reading where if you're if you're uh, a literature student it may be that when you read primary texts you try at least to read them in a linear completist way but that when you're reading a uh, let's say an encyclopedia of narratological terms you're going to be 
skipping around um, so that actually each discipline contains within it these different um, different temporalities of reading. Um, yeah, and just because you mentioned ebooks, I was curious about whether there's any kind of um, like equivalent study done on ebooks to tell how they're read, whether some books are read more linearly, like whether there's an equivalent for, for digital books. Because in physical books is really cool what you're describing. I hadn't thought about it at all. But um, so I'm curious how that, whether that, and if that um, translates over to the digital world. No, that's a really interesting question because in one way, of course, we have way more data about the reading of electronic books or the book length equivalent of what could more generally be called analytics. We've got way more data about that than we could ever know about the use of printed books. And in a different way, we, if we're talking about scholars, have less data about that because it's proprietary commercial data. So the data exists, but access to it is not necessarily a given. And um, the bits of data that have been made publicly available one of the disappointments for historians of reading like me in um, encountering that data is that there aren't a whole lot of surprises. So that, for example, um, the short-lived uh, subscription service, Oyster, which is probably before the time of many people on the Zoom, but it was a sort of bookish equivalent to uh, sort of all you can read bookish equivalent to Spotify. Um, uh, collected and uncharacteristically made public uh, quite detailed I mean, aggregate data about how, what proportion of a book most readers uh, actually accessed. Um, and this was in the context of their decision to base payments to content providers, to authors, on the proportion of the book that was read. Um, and it turned out that most readers never got more than 10% in, which is very consonant with the kind of evidence of wear and tear on printed books. So it was one of those things that didn't seem to revolutionize the field. It just kind of corroborated what what we've thought for a long time and maybe the only difference was that um i felt like a little bit of a jump for having put so much work into uh in, into gathering this data in such a labor intensive speculative way when um you know someone else could just uh Yes. <laughs> well, there, there, there it was. It's like when you're standing on the roadside waiting for the bus and then the taxi goes by and splashes you with with mud. But at the same time, um, I think that that kind of consumer research would usefully be informed by book history because uh, when Oyster uh, set up their system for determining how much to pay content providers, uh, they, if someone gave up, if, if someone didn't read through to the 20th percentile of the book, they took that as the person having stopped at 10%. It didn't occur to them that people sometimes skip to the index and then go back. So I think they themselves were working with this very linear model where reading a book is like uh, drinking a soda you know if you drink a quarter of the soda you know they're not asking whether you went to the bottom to fish out the ice cubes um yeah tamara hi um so i'm old enough to have spent a lot of my career reading <laughs> paper books and less on kindle but i do deal with electronic books I have a Kindle, which I use for some things, and I also run into electronic textbooks in um, I teach genetics. And what I find is I am not fond at all of e-textbooks 
because of the lack of ability to be able to browse them easily. And that's something I, you know, I find. And so I'm always going to the textbook providers and, you know, at least for my sake, getting hold of a paper copy. So during the pandemic, I got about half a dozen textbooks shipped to my house so I could actually read through the paper copy because I was thinking about changing textbooks. So that's one thing I, I, w I was thinking of. And just in general, I find um, I often just keep going back to paper books because um, I feel, I don't know, it's, I, can't, I don't get as, as, as engaged and I don't know where I am in the story because uh, I tend or whatever I'm reading because, you know, I can check and see what percent I'm at, but it's just not the same. I can't judge where I am within the arc of the story, you know, in a way you normally would with a hard copy book. So I was wondering about your reaction on, on those observations. No, I think that point about locating yourself is a really interesting one that maybe brings the print book together with the print map, because I am also of the ancient generation that um, if I unfurl a map, uh, a printed map, um, it gives me, for one thing, it gives me cues about where I've been before because I can see where the, I can see certain people on this call nodding and certain people on the call not nodding, but um, it gives me clues about which folds in the map have been most uh, folded and unfolded. Um, and it also, gives me a sense of scale that I find hard to get when I'm just, um, you know, looking at my, at my phone. And likewise, in a book, I think it's true that um, although one can use the scroll bar, there's that sense of auto location is purely visual, whereas when you're holding a book, it's even like you get a sense of which of your hands is supporting a heavier Wait, um, if you think of the end of Northanger Abbey, where Austin's narrator uh, tells the reader that uh, the telltale compression of pages will inform them that we are hastening toward perfect felicity, that is, that the marriage ending is approaching. Um, I know that, so I read uh, detective fiction a lot. I Me too. <laughs> There you go. So I tend to, um, these days I tend to listen to it in audiobook form, but I find that I'm less good at guessing the, um, the solution to the mystery because not having that tactile sense of how long there is to the ending uh, removes the clue of like, oh, I know that there's going to be a double twist, not a triple twist because there are only a few pages left. Or I know that no new characters are going to be introduced because I'm already two thirds of the way through. And then the question that you that you raise about browsing a textbook, um, for me at this stage in the history of electronic publishing, I feel like e-textbooks are the worst of both worlds because they're not navigable and modular in the way that a website is, but they also don't have the kind of absorptive uh, power to focus our concentration that a printed book does. Um, and then there's the question of how far the e-textbook is a genuine generic formal category or how far the ebook is a commercial category designed by vendors like Amazon to um, make certain books uh, re rented rather than licensed rather than bought and um, to create a different system of uh, making samples available and so forth. So I think there's also that uh, instability right now in academic publishing 
when is a university press book labeled an e-textbook and what does that do to its commercial fortunes? But um, other questions or, or other comments? Um, yes, I was wondering, uh, in your book, what we talk about when we talk about books, uh, at some point you're talking about how the digital age printed book isn't really an old medium at all. So I, I was wondering, um, according to you, in what innovative ways do you think the printed book is being reinvented as a format nowadays? That's a great question, and um, I would love in a minute to hear other people's thoughts about this in, at, in a very um, short-term window. The, I mean, as you all know, we're in the midst of a supply chain crisis and a paper shortage, and um, from a more parochial vantage point, I've been struck that during the uh, latest wave of lockdowns that a lot of book artists have been working with some form of the kit. So like sending, um, sending supplies for people to make their own books or uh, printing part of a book or uh, creating part of a zine and then mailing it to a collaborator in a kind of exquisite corpse process. Um, so I'm curious whether any of you have been experimenting with making books or exchanging books or zines or any other kind of format in different ways um, during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I, I see a hand in the, um, the uh, collective space. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, um, well, I like making books in general, like in, I think starting in sixth grade or so. Um, and I found that it was kind of the opposite during the pandemic. I stopped, I mean, I was, I was never really going out to buy supplies, but even less that we were like legally not allowed to go out and buy supplies. Um, so I started using like for the covers, um, old cereal boxes or things like that and going through my like giant pile of stuff things just looking for something that could work. Um, and actually my product now is making a kind of little magazine and so now I've been like typing it on the computer but I'm going to print it. I've been playing with like different ways to, to pop up some things. But still trying as much as possible to stay within things that I have easy access to. Um, with like a couple of exceptions regarding the illustrations, but other than that, it was kind of awkward that I took this with everything that I had already available to me. Wow, that's fascinating. Anyone else? Um, yeah, well, actually, recently I went to an exposition, an art exposition, and there were a lot, lots of people selling zines and little books that they, they made themselves. And uh, I thought it was interesting that many of the zines that were sold there were part zine, so part book, and part poster when you completely mm. unfold them. So the book kind of becomes this really artistic object and this, uh, this, this object that's meant to be exhibited and looked at rather than read. So I thought that was uh, interesting. Well, and it's interesting that you mention folding because, I mean, we've been talking in various, con we've ended up talking in various contexts today about folding. And I do think that one reason that there's been an upsurge in some parts of the world and interest in origami and other kinds of paper folding is precisely that a screen is flat and we're all spending so much time on, as we are right now, on these flat rectangles. And so that to think about either the book as this kind of, um, uh, it's a rectangle, but it becomes um, some kind of something more like a, a triangle or some other shape, or um, the piece of paper as something that can be folded in different ways. It's just a way of reminding us of getting ourselves out of, I feel that we're all living right now in something like um, Abbott's dystopian uh, fantasy Flatland, uh, and the paper there's something, um, again, this is going to sound cheesy, but for me, there's something therapeutic about being reminded of those other dimensions. 
that's kind of a nice segue into in the very beginning when you were talking about maybe guys in the in the collective space why don't you take off your mask because because uh your computer doesn't have a great microphone anymore. Yeah. <laughs> sorry for that um but that's a nice segue into something that's sort of been i'm not even sure what my question or comment is but when you were talking about the book being worn in certain parts and not others and the first thing that came to mind were some of my university textbooks and how there was kind of a shame as well as a pride for a textbook that was completely worn all the way through so that every page had been poured over and i think the pride part of it was just knowing how much effort was put into gleaning, like taking the information from that. And I was thinking a little bit the same as what Tamara had said, which is I don't like e-textbooks because there's something about getting lost within the vastness of that information that you don't have with the book. But then the other thing that I thought, and I wonder if this connects to what you just said, which is, is there some connection to the knowledge when you have a physical thing to actually relate it to? And I don't know if it's a, I don't know, it just, it, like, there's some kind of a, like a love or a respect that you get when you have this physical thing that has just given you knowledge. And I wonder if you have any comment on that. No, that's interesting. And um, I think your point about the double edgedness of wear and tear on books is one that operates in many different contexts of the book world ranging from uh, the way that the market value of an old book can be either decreased by wear and tear if it's just like the copy of the textbook that has someone else's highlightings in it or vastly increased by the wear and tear if it's been scribbled up by some famous person and so that would be the commercial side of what you're saying and then maybe the religious side of what you're saying is that in so many religious traditions um there's a tension between the imperative to respect the sacred book treat it gently on the one hand and then on the other hand um the feeling of shame if the book is if the sacred book is so pristine that it hasn't that it makes clear that it hasn't been used. Um, uh, Tamara. I was just thinking when you're talking about annotating books, I was thinking about two things with annotating books. So one of them is thinking about cookbooks mm. and, you know, annotating them. And, you know, I, I tend not to write in books that much. But cookbooks, I do, because I want to go in and make a note on whether it worked, if I made any changes that work, so that I can go back and, and repeat the same thing. And, um, yeah, that's, that's interesting, because normally I try to take really good care of my books, but cookbooks, that's kind of partly how I love them, I guess, is, is, to, is to write in them. And, of course, I mean, I think cookbooks are one of the, along with textbooks, they're one of the most interesting case studies of looking at what what is happening to the cookbook now um, in terms of how far is it modular, how far are people searching collections of web-based recipes or searching recipe by recipe, and then the kind of information that you're describing, like, oh, uh, these pages stick together that means that that's the version of the pancake recipe that really worked for me. Um, how to incorporate that in, I mean, so many people have tried to develop such elaborate cooking apps and it's, none of them seem to have really caught on in the way in which the YouTube video the cooking video has caught on, which is in some ways a very, um, it's not an interactive form. It's a form that's difficult to annotate. Um, so I, I think there was a moment uh, early on in the era of electronic publishing where cookbooks and textbooks, print cookbooks and print textbooks 
seem to be in a very similar place in terms of both being random access, highly annotated print formats, and then they really went in drastically opposite directions. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm old, so I'm thinking Hunger Games, like the bits of that that are that where loads of people have annotated tend to be uh, the bits where a character thinks something like, um, life didn't always give you what you expected, thought Kateness. You know, it's these moments of profundity. Um, I mean, and in some ways, again, that's very similar to the older print and manuscript era uh, practice of commonplacing, of copying out wise quotations into a notebook. I mean, we know in great detail that people used those commonplace books as a sort of source for um, quotable quotes. For example, if you were making a speech, if you were writing a letter, you would go to your commonplace book. Uh, I don't have a good sense, I would be curious if anyone has a good sense of what readers are using those Kindle highlights for. I know that when I read as a scholar, I annotate, I highlight things on my Kindle, and then I cut and paste those annotations into the Zotero file, and then sometimes I'll cut and paste them in turn into uh, an article I'm writing. So it's, it's a citational practice. It's about quoting other scholars. But if you're a teenager reading you know, reading genre fiction, do you go back to your highlights? Do you keep your highlights? Do you reread your highlights? I don't know. What I, I don't know with what horizon of use these highlights are being made. No, I, I, I don't really have an answer. I had more of a question about that. Um, do you know how many teenagers are all highlighting things? Because I remember, like, I have always hated annotating things, like, we were forced to do it in school for like, you know, showing that we read the article and I just mm. liked it with a passion. Like I annotated as little as I could while still getting the marks for it. And most of my friends were like that too. Like I don't remember, I think the only things we ever annotated were school books or school papers. And we were reading anything. Actually, most of us ended up writing in the book, but we were kind of um, and I'm still very much like that. So I'm, I'm curious, like it wouldn't have occurred to me that teenagers were highlighting things either physically or for the kingdom. I was just wondering like how much, how, how common that is, basically. This is my school, right? Interesting. Does anyone have thoughts about that? Or thought, thoughts about how you've been taught to handle books to annotate books, what kinds of prescriptive discourses your reading is shaped by? Mia, can I, sorry, can I interrupt? Because a, a lot of questions have been burning and I know you have to leave soon. Uh, I really want to ask you. So we've had a case recently in Canada where, uh, you know, a, a uh, I just had a very sad case of a school board who wanted to do something socially acceptable and it, it burned many, many books. So, yeah, I know that's the reaction. And uh, so there are many reasons for this, but I'd like to take maybe have your, have your just a couple of minutes, your thoughts on why does it feel so painful to throw away a book? Or why do we react with so, so much violence to burning books when copies of books are actually, you know, they're frequent. They're, it's not as if we're losing the actual book as they, as they used to in the Middle Ages. Why do you think that is so strong within most people? No, that's a fascinating tension, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it feels like sacrilege to burn books. And on the other hand, anyone here who's ever had to um, dispose of a dead, uh, friend or relative's collection, or indeed anyone here who's had to d try to dispose of part of their own collection when you're moving, will know that it's actually incredibly hard to 
you have to pay people a lot to take away books. It is prohibitively hard to donate books so that the theory is that we all, that they're incredibly valuable and the practice is that um, they're not valued at all. And in the sense, we there, se there seems to be a kind of hypocrisy um, governing our relation to books. Uh, I don't know whether people here saw a kerfuffle on social media in the US a few months ago where uh, a, a library was shamed for by someone Instagramming photographs of the dumpsters outside the library where they'd discarded books. But I mean, maybe with books as with babies or as with pets, you know, people get ter terribly sentimental about other people mistreating them. And yet if you ask people like, are you willing to take in the pets or adopt the kids or whatever, then they, they are not so eager to do it. And, you know, the, the librarians said, look, we've got limited shelf space. You tell, you know, if you want to give our library more funding for more shelf space, be our guest. But, but there was just this kind of visceral response, not even to the burning, but just to, I think, the equivalent of committing infanticide by exposing the baby, not, not, you know, not, not, not by burning the baby, just by leaving it out on the hillside. Um, so no, I think that's, that, that's a question that tells you so much about our ambivalence and misperception of our own valuation of books. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you for having taken the time to speak to us uh, and taking some time from your busy day. It was really, really, really rich and interesting for all of us. So thanks so much. Uh, all right, any last word from anyone? No, just thank you so much for, I mean, I have a million more questions I could have asked. <laughs> Thank, thank you all for being here and stay well and I hope your books stay well too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks Olivia. Thank you Leah.